So, uh, without any further ado, I want to say a word about um, Bill Sargent. Um, I guess it was watching or seeing uh, the uh, current back some months ago, and Bill was featured in that. And I started thinking, you know, it would be really good to, to do something uh, with Bill Sargent, taking the science approach to um, what is going on with our coastline. And uh, Bill, uh, as it turned out, I was picked up a couple of his books and uh, uh, enjoyed reading them. And of course, there's there are a whole bunch of them over here, and we're going to be selling them for those of you who would, who would like uh, to pick up uh, Bill's books. But he is a science person, he is a writer, he is a person clearly who has great uh, devotion to uh, our natural world and our understanding or misunderstanding of it. Uh, about the same time that uh, I got aware of Bill, I uh, sort of followed where he was going. We went over to the, uh, uh, the meeting of people who eventually became Storm Surge. Well, this is a wonderful turnout. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to, to Mike. Mike Morris is the head of the steering committee of Storm Surge, and he'll do the next phase of this, and we'll get going. So I'd like to welcome you all here on behalf of Storm Surge, and we're a newly formed group. We're barely nine months old, I think, since so uh, people started talking about it back, uh, I think it was maybe March or so. And uh, we're basically made up of concerned citizens, and scientists, writers, lecturers, some educators, local business people, and also even some uh, project managers. And what we're concerned about is what's coming down the pipe. We're concerned about the future. And living here on the coastline, we're starting to see some of the effects of climate-enhanced storm activity and sea level rise. And last one was quite level down on the island. Nobody could escape all the press that uh, was received from that. So, as a civilization, we're really entering uncharted waters here. We're entering an environment that humans have never experienced before. This, this past uh, spring, the Mauna Loa Observatory reported over 40 parts per million of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. And since humans have been alive, that's never ever happened before. So, if we go back to the fossil record, and we look at the last time it was 400 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, coupled with the amount of heat that we have in our oceans and our atmosphere, our sea level was actually 21 feet higher. So if you want to think about it this way, we've essentially set the thermostat for 21 feet of water. And the challenge we face uh, as a civilization is figuring out when that water is going to arrive and how fast. Now, the International Panel on Climate Change seems to think it's going to be about three feet of water by the end of the century. Now, every time they update their statistics, the levels keep going higher and more water keeps coming sooner because these supercomputers are getting more information and they're starting to figure out, oh, we forgot about this variable here that we didn't put into the, uh, into the equation. So anyway, social change in communities move very slowly, as we all know. It takes a long time to get things done compared to somebody running their own business. So in order to kind of get the masses moving, we want to raise awareness locally for what's coming down the pipe. And part of that is having programs like this and getting the word out and hopefully inspiring uh, people like you to talk to your friends and bring more people back for some of the other programs that we're going to have. Now we've got four more programs this fall besides uh, Bill's here tonight. and. Um, do we have a handout on that? Or do you want me to read through? In front of the program, that's the handed out. Okay, so these speakers, they're all very knowledgeable in this area. They're university level professors and, uh, and PhDs. And they're going to speak, and I won't go through the whole list, 
but uh, we're going to speak on various topics, some of them a little bit more local to New England, others are going to be talking a little bit more about the East Coast and taking a larger view of uh, sea level rise, and then others are going to be talking about, you know, what do we do to accommodate this, do we adapt, do we fight it, do uh, we retreat, and there's going to be individual uh, situations that are all different, sometimes you might want to shore up, other times it makes sense to head to higher ground. But in any event, I don't want to talk any... It wasn't on the front of it. Okay. It wasn't? No. no. Okay. No. If you want to hear this, Kevin, I'll just go through that real quickly. Okay, so on the 21st of October, we have Dr. Cameron Wake, and he's from the University of New Hampshire, and he's a research associate professor for climatology and glaciology. He's going to talk about climate change here in New England, he's going to be looking at uh, the past, the present, and what he thinks is going to happen in the future. Then, our next one is on November 4th, and that is with uh, Dr. Rob Thieler, and he's a research uh, geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey in Woods Hole, and he's going to talk more about the East Coast and how uh, climate change is affecting all the barrier islands from the Carolinas on up. And then, on uh, mid-November, on the 18th, we have uh, John Anderson, who is the Director of Education at the New England Aquarium. And he's going to talk about how do we engage in conversations about adaptation and mitigation, and how do we deal with, uh, with uh, our changing climate. Um, we're hope, hoping to have a film uh, about last winter's events on Plum Island in early December, but uh, we're going to be previewing that first to see if it's something we want to present or not. So, but we'll make an announcement with that. And actually, if you could sign up on an email list, we'll send you reminders letting you know when these programs are coming up and where they're going to be held. If we start to see more and more people coming, we might have to get a bigger venue uh, to accommodate everybody. And then the last event uh, we have uh, in this educational series is going to be on the 16th of December. And that is by Dr. Paul Kirshen. He's a research professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of New Hampshire. And he's going to talk about uh, assessing vulnerability and planning on how to adapt to rising sea levels of climate change. So I don't want to delay it any further. I, I was just going to mention also, if you're interested in knowing another way to get this information, is we now have a storm surge uh, Facebook page. You don't have to belong to Facebook. You can just search on um, Facebook Storm Search, and we have all of the events listed there as well. Okay. And secondly, the, this sign-up sheet has an email address. If you sign up, you get notification of any of the things that are going on. So who hasn't seen this? Or we can have it here at the table afterwards, too. Yes. It will be here. So I don't want to delay it any further. You didn't come to listen to me tonight. We're going to introduce Bill Sargent. And he's a fellow group member. And has uh, spent quite a bit of time in this area, writing about uh, barrier islands and things that have happened down in Chatham. And he's going to talk to us about the, uh, the tough winter we had at the line. Thank you very much, uh, both Walter and Michael. First of all, does anybody mind if I take my jacket off? No. <laughs> Take your time. I thought it was going to be my next question. Can I take my time? Um, I, do this, I do this to find out what kind of an audience I have, but now I know. Okay, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, part of the reason I, that I wore up uh, my jacket and tie was because I thought this might be held at the bank. And I always make a point whenever I go to the bank of wearing a, a coat and tie. It hasn't helped yet, but I keep hoping. I actually have a friend, and her mother owned a marina in Salem. And uh, she had to get a bank loan. And, uh, and she was really in desperate straits. And so she went out, and with her last you know, couple hundred dollars, she bought some jod boards and some riding clothes. And then she went into the bank and kept looking and she said, I hope we can do this very quickly because I want to make my, uh, my riding lesson. She got the loan just like that. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we, will, we will jump to the slides now. Um, if, if you remember about this time in 2011, we actually had a rogue storm that occurred right towards the end of October, snowstorm earlier than usual, and then after that, it was like clicking a switch. All of a sudden, it got warm, the forsythia came out, the lilacs came out, 
Uh, and then we had 60 or 70 degree weather, um, you know, all through uh, November, uh, December, January. And I, I was writing about this and I kept, first of all, you know, we had the hottest December on record. Then we had the hottest January on record. Then we had the hottest three months on record. And then it kept going and going and going until, in fact, we had the hottest year on record. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and probably a lot of you are familiar with this is sort of the iconic uh, graph. Um, and what it shows is actually the Earth breathing, if you will. Uh, it shows you the, the levels of carbon dioxide that go up and down with the seasons as the, as the trees are releasing oxygen and taking in carbon dioxide and then, and then respirating uh, carbon again. So you can see that the, that the whole planet is, bleeding, is, is uh, breathing like that, but you'll also see that that line is trending up. Uh, and this indicates to you that the sea level rise, that, that uh, carbon dioxide has been rising since they first started taking these measurements back in 1957. Uh, I actually, the first time I saw this, I was sitting right beside Al Gore. Uh, and we were in a special seminar uh, at Harvard. And Dr. Rebell had come in from the Scripps Institute. And he showed us this, uh, this slide. And as soon as you knew that you had carbon dioxide rising, rising like that, you knew you were going to have the, uh, the greenhouse effect, you were going to have global warming, and you were going to have the sea levels rise. Uh, that was about 40 years ago. And what have we done about it since then? Nothing. Um, I, I will finally say one other thing, and that is um, I'm still ticked at Harvard because I was, uh, Al Gore was taking the course as a full credit uh, uh, student, <laughs> and I was auditing the course. So but anyway, the next slide, please. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, because of that, carbon dioxide uh, has been uh, accumulating, the, the, oh, particularly the oceans have been warming, and when you warm up water, the oceans actually expand. So most of, we've been getting about a foot of sea level rise uh, ever since the glaciers started retreating back about 10,000 years ago. Uh, within the last 20 years, it's gone up to about a foot and a half. And that's because of the heating of the, uh, of the oceans. So probably most of you remember going to your favorite beach uh, as a kid and remember when maybe that beach was 100 feet wide. And now you go to the same beach and the waves are lapping up against the dune line. Uh, so that's the increase that we've been seeing just in our own lifetime. Yes, next. Uh, and of course, when this first came out, uh, and, or initially it came out in uh, Scientific American, uh, and when the first study came out, they said we were going to have 150 feet of sea level rise in the next 100 years. Uh, and it was picked up by all kinds of prestigious uh, uh, journals. <laughs> and, uh, and you saw you know, headlines like this. And, uh, but then about six months later, there was a little tiny footnote in Scientific American that basically said, whoops, we made a mathematical mistake. And it's not going to be 150 feet. It's going to be more like 100 feet in the next 100 years. And then they said, then it's going to be like 50 feet, and then it's going to be 25 feet, and then it got down to 6 feet. And finally, they got down to about 3 feet every 100 years, uh, which, is, which, which, which is what we have now. Next. Um, the other thing that happened, um, again, as I mentioned, it was, it was like flipping a switch on the wall. And we switched from El Nino to La Nina. And this is a, this is a climatological pattern in, in the Pacific, where you have a warming uh, of, of, the, of the central uh, part of the, of the Pacific. And as soon as that happens, the, the, the weather systems across the United States just absolutely switch. And that's when we started getting getting the warnings, uh, the, 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 the warming. Um, I, uh, you know, normally I would just put this in, but there's always some wise guy in the, in the back of the room that says, well, wasn't it because of global warming? So it was actually about half and half between global warming and this climatological change. Next. Um, and of course, we remember that all the droughts that we had. Next. Um, I actually did uh, a little film about, uh, about the corn that was dying off. Um, corn is very susceptible to drought. You actually have to have humidity in the air for it to, to, uh, for it to propagate. 
And so I brought this corn cob home, and, uh, and I took some pictures of it, and then I saved it. And, and then by the spring, it was still pretty good looking. So I said, well, geez, maybe I'll try to you know, plant those uh, kernels. And so I spread them around the backyard, figuring maybe two or three would actually grow. My whole backyard looked like <laughs> Iowa. Um, you know, I've, I've been eating corn for the last three months. Next. Um, and then, of course, we had a number of forest fires. Next. Uh, this is a special equipment for dropping water down retardant on the forest fires. Next. Uh, and then around here, of course, we had a lot of storms uh, and wicked high tides, if you will. Next. Um, and then, of course, we remember uh, Hurricane Sandy coming up from the Caribbean. Next. Um, I went down to, uh, this is uh, Pavilion Beach in, uh, uh, in Ipswich. And the interesting thing uh, about uh, when Hurricane Sandy hit, uh, when it hit New York, it came at the high tide with a storm surge and um, everything all together, and it was fairly close to the center. We actually would have had the almost the same amount of damage uh, as New York, except it came in to us at low tide. So we had about 10 feet less water uh, than we would have if it came in at high tide. Uh, but we would have been in, even though we were still fairly far from the, the center of the storm, we would have been in real trouble. Next. Um, I went out down to the Payne House, uh, which is just around the corner. Next. Nice sort of, it was getting very atmospheric. And then we went down to, uh, to Plum Island. Next. And uh, Channel 5 was out there. And what they were doing uh, was a process called beach scraping. So essentially what they were doing is was scraping sand off the low tide area and then building up a dune towards the uh, uh, houses. Next. Uh, and that, what, that went on into the night. Next. Uh, and there were all kinds of interviews were going on. We remember all that. Next. This is Bob Connors. Uh, and actually, um, and this is what it looked like after they had created that dune. Uh, you know, right up against all the uh, up against all the houses, and if you'll notice this little stairway that came down to the top of the dune. Next, this is what it looked like two high tides later. Um, that initial high tide came in and removed about 30 feet of sand because it was unconsolidated; uh, it hadn't been tampered down by the waves. And then uh, the next high tide came in. And because of the scraping, it had sort of funneled the, the, uh, the waves right, right in. So you've had another about 10 feet uh, of, of uh, sand that was washed away. Next. So it actually had increased the, uh, the amount of erosion. Of course, they were having a much worse situation down in uh, New Jersey. Next. Uh, massive waves coming in. Next. I thought this looked a little bit like the Hiroshima uh, uh, <laughs> print. Next. I, I tried to turn that around to get them to match, but you can't do that on a computer. It seems like you can do everything else. And of course, uh, Wall Street was getting, was getting hit, and they had all these sandbags to prevent uh, flooding. Next. Um, we also remember this iconic shot of, uh, of the crane that broke and it was hanging there, uh, you know, for several weeks. Next. Uh, a lot of people had to be evacuated. One of the interesting things that they found in New York uh, is nobody likes to be evacuated. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, want to stay particularly in these buildings in the city. And now actually what they're doing is they're planning for that. Um, so they're trying to make the buildings uh, resilient to the storm. So they're taking the electrical systems out of the basement and putting them up higher, so that and then, you know, so that you can actually have food and that people could, you know, survive still in that building for a couple of weeks until everything gets back to normal. Next, uh, and of course uh, we remember all the tunnels that were flooded. This was a shopping mall. Uh, actually, when, when uh, Walter initially asked me if, if I'd like to give a talk, he asked me if I'd like to uh, speak about the waterfront. And he explained uh, he's, you know, that, that I might be between the NRA and a cow. And uh, <laughs> that didn't sound like a very you know, safe place to be. So I decided we would, we would write, I would talk about something less controversial. Uh, but this just does 
you know, we do want to think about this when you're thinking about uh, uh, building, you know, underground uh, uh, parking uh, in an area that's close to the water. Next. Um, this, of course, is what happened in New York. Thousands and thousands of cars uh, were damaged because of that. As a matter of fact, you did not want to buy a used car anywhere in New York or New Jersey for about three months uh, because their electricity, their electrical systems had all been, uh, had all been wiped out. Next. Uh, and this was a ship that ran aground uh, in uh, Far Rockaway. Next. And this, of course, was the, uh, the, the, the ship that they filmed the Mutiny on the Bounty on. And actually, this, the last port that this ship had been to was Newburyport. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure some of you know the people who were on that ship, and several of them uh, uh, died in the, in the hurricane. Next. Um, and uh, this was in Brooklyn, and this was a bull shark uh, that was swimming around people's back porch that somehow had been swept in. Next. Uh, and of course, uh, this is another iconic shot of New Jersey, uh, where the uh, uh, roller coaster had been washed right off the uh, pier and was sitting in the Atlantic Ocean. And actually, they, when, when Prince Harry came down, uh, they brought him down to see this. Uh, and then afterwards, they cut it all down because they figured, you know, some wiseacres would try to, uh, you know, go surfing through that uh, in the coming summer. Next. Um, and of course, President Obama toured uh, the whole area. Next. Um, and one of the interesting things that you can see is uh, a process that's called rollover. And essentially what happened, the whole Massachusetts coast lost about 20 feet uh, this past winter. And what happens is that if you get a barrier beach like this, the ocean will pick up about you know, anywhere from 50 feet to 100 feet. And then, it, and then it rolls it over. It just washes it over the island. So the island essentially rolls over itself. Uh, and, and you get all of the sand that, that goes into the center of the island and, and into all the streets. Next. And this, of course, is the reason that you don't want to you know, have permanent structures on a beach. Can somebody tell me what state is most likely to get a major storm like Sandy in any particular year? Any guesses? Florida. Oh, some there's always some wise guy who knows how to read a graph. Uh, you're right. Uh, it's actually Massachusetts, uh, and the reason for that is we get the hurricanes coming up from the south in the summer, uh, in the summer, and then you get the northeasters in the winter. And we're all familiar that actually it's the northeasters that do the most. Uh, erosion damage because they hang around for several tidal cycles. Uh, so the, the, the hurricanes do the wind damage, uh, but it's the northeasters that, that do the cumulative damage. Next. Uh, and of course, we all remember uh, this was the year 2005. We had so many hurricanes that we went through the whole English alphabet and, and uh, into the Greek alphabet. Um, and uh, just Kind of interesting, here we are what, uh, October 9th, and we were already up to Vince. And I think our last one was uh, yeah. Carrie or something, something like that. Karen. So it's been an extremely uh, uh, calm year. Next. Um, and what was kind of interesting is that in the, in the, uh, in the 40s and 50s, you had a 30-year period uh, where there were about 15 major storms. Then, in the, uh, from about the, the early 60s up until 1992, you only had three major storms. And that is a similar, that's caused by a similar climato climatological oscillation in the Atlantic. And essentially what happens when you get a lot of stormy weather coming off of Africa, then you have uh, a lot of hurricanes. Uh, and then when that switches and you have drier air, uh, you can have a 30-year period uh, where you'll have very few hurricanes. Now, we don't really know, you know what's going on uh, this year. Um, we've had very, very few hurricanes, and it's possible that we're you know, seeing ourselves going back into a situation like this. Uh, I wouldn't make any definitive uh, statements about it until we come to the end of the, uh, to the, end of the season. There's also some studies that say 
in the kind of situation that we have now, you get the more powerful storms towards the end of the season, which is what we had uh, last year with, with, with last year with Sandy and Irene the year before. Um, so the, 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 you know, the jury is still out on that. Next. Um, and then, of course, as we started moving up into, uh, into March, uh, we had had about four major storms up here uh, and also down in Long Island. Uh, this woman got stuck in her car uh, and uh, she didn't think she was going to make it. And she actually, you know, wrote a letter to all her kids saying how wonderful they were and to have a good life and, and you know, uh, to please remember me. And, and she thought she was going to die. Uh, and, uh, and then she got a nice knock on the window and a state cop, uh, you know, rescued her. Um, but it was a very, you know, serious situation. Um, I think you all remember in the, heart, in the blizzard of 1978, we had hundreds of people who actually were trapped and, and killed in their cars. Next. Um, and uh, uh, this time, uh, in the March storm, um, uh, Governor uh, Patrick um, actually had a ban on driving, similar to what we did in 1978. I don't know what everybody thinks about that. I think it was exactly the right thing to do because we didn't have people caught in their cars. They were able to clean up the situation. Uh, next. Um, and because you couldn't drive, I went down behind our house to where there's a causeway leading out to uh, Smith Island, and it had this kind of uh, actually quite beautiful uh, winter appearance to it. Next. Um, and then I drove up to uh, 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 Plum Island, and uh, it looked like a war scene. You know, the, uh, the, the National Guard were out. Uh, next. Um, and then up in Salisbury, uh, you know, you had just everything was blocked in with snow. There was about a foot of sand uh, on, the, on the, all the streets. It was very, very hard to drive. It would sort of catch your, your wheels, and it was, uh, you were skidding around. Um, and initially I thought the sand trucks had been coming out, you know, to get rid of it, and then it finally clicked. All that sand had come off the beach and had been washed <coughs> all through the, the streets of Salisbury. Next. Uh, uh, a number of people uh, were, you know, their houses were destroyed. Uh, on this house, a wave came smashing in. Uh, it actually knocked this window on top of the, of the woman who owned the house. Uh, and she was trapped uh, in about three feet of water under the plate of glass uh, and almost didn't make it. And then, you know, the, the uh, fire, firemen came in the back of the house and, and rescued her. Next. Um, again, you know, very wintry conditions. Next. Um, and then on Plum Island, uh, people came down to see the situation. Next. Um, and these, of course, were the geotubes uh, that had been put in to uh, protect these uh, houses. Next. Um, just been put in, you know, a week before. Next. And you can see what happened to them in the storm. They were all being torn apart by the waves and also these, the timbers that were, that were coming up against them and, and tearing the fabric. Next. Um, and, of course, you always have some wiseacres that, uh, you know, want to go out on the beach. Next. Uh, next. These guys, and the Coast Guard had to uh, direct them off the beach. A couple of them, you know, took waves, you know, almost up to their, almost up to their hips. As a matter of fact, uh, and yeah, if we go back to that, uh, actually on that, during that same day, um, uh, a couple people were uh, at the center groin uh, and, um, and they were actually washed fell over and were washed back about 40 feet. Um, so it was, a, it was a fairly dangerous situation. Uh, somebody wanted to know what groins are. Uh, and they're not these things. Uh, but the groins are a, a, a stone structure that, that sticks out perpendicular to the beach. Uh, and it's, uh, it's considered to be an anti-erosion device. We'll be talking more about that later next. Um, and then um, all of a sudden we started hearing houses starting to go in. Uh, I was in the Connors' house at the time when this one went in next. And uh, the Weather Channel came up. Uh, and uh, they were all, again, the whole uh, press corps was here next. Um, this is uh, Michael Riley, the uh, chief of uh, um, uh, police for uh, the, the town of Newbury. 
And you can see he looks a little bit concerned here. Uh, and everybody was very sleep deprived. We had been through, you know, four storms, and uh, particularly the last storm lasted for about four days, and everybody had been up. Um, you also notice he's, he's a fairly hefty guy. Next. And uh, we, what, we, again, we were up on uh, Connors' uh, uh, porch, and when you went up to the porch, uh, you looked down through the garage. The bottom of the garage had been torn off, and you were looking at 20-foot waves that were crashing into the bottom of the house. Next. Uh, and they were also crashing into the deck. And that's where all the press were. Uh, so, you know, it would have been a fantastic photo op, you know, if, uh, if you had one of these waves that came in and, you know, half of the New England press corps were, uh, were washed away. Actually, I was standing here taking some of these photographs, and one of these rogue waves came in and, you know, came right up to my, uh, up to my knees. Next. Um, and then the house started going down on the other side. Next. Uh, and you started having all the fire trucks appear throughout the streets. Next. Um, and people had to uh, evacuate. Next. And of course, this happened, you know, it, with a lot of rain and everything like that. And people had to get their computers out and, and uh, uh, all of their equipment. Um, I, you know, to me, that's very poignant since my whole life, you know, lives in a computer. The thought of, you know, having to get it out of the rain is, is pretty disturbing. Um, and uh, about 39 uh, homes uh, were uh, declared uninhabitable. Next. Um, and uh, people were kept off the beach uh, for a couple of days when this was going on. Next. Uh, and then uh, you started seeing these excavators that were uh, actually removing um, about the six houses that had gone uh, off of the, off of the uh, bank. Next. Um, and then people were uh, doing what they could to protect their homes. Sometimes you had to just take off the front porch because it was pulling the whole house down um, because there was no sand underneath. Next. Um, and uh, this was kind of interesting because these big concrete blocks uh, appeared. And they had been put down in the 70s. And nobody had seen them uh, uh, you know, since the 70s until uh, uh, it eroded back in this storm. Next. <coughs> Um, and, and then uh, you had more excavators coming down next. Um, and they actually started building uh, this seawall. Uh, and um, they didn't have permission to do this. And it also wasn't designed. You know, normally you would go out and you would hire an engineer. Uh, you'd spend several thousand dollars to get permission to do this. And you would come up with a design so that you would have fabric uh, behind those rocks. If you don't have fabric behind rocks, what happens is the waves will come in and the rocks actually accelerate the power of the waves. So then the waves will pull the sand out from behind the rocks uh, and you increase the amount of erosion. Next. Um, and this just simply shows you what happens. Again, you have a rock wall like that. You have a storm come in. It undermines, it both undermines the wall and it takes the, the sand out from behind the wall. And you end up uh, with a situation like this. Next. Uh, and also putting in these large concrete blocks will tend to increase the amount of uh, erosion downstream uh, of, the, of the blocks. Next. Um, and a, a lot of those seawalls had been covered with sand. Uh, and you can see already uh, that that sand has been washed away. Um, you know, and we're just coming into the uh, uh, into the winter season. Next. Um, and uh, this was one of the houses um, that was actually lifted up and uh, set on these uh, wooden uh, structures. And then that, that house has actually been moved across the street. Next. Um, and this was taken only uh, about a week ago. Uh, and you can see it was moved back to the other side of the street. Um, so that will give them several more years. And actually, um, that's, that's the sort of thing that you want to do, uh, is you want to relocate some of these buildings uh, or, and, and or elevate them. Next. Um, so this is, uh, this is the Plum Island system. It's very similar to uh, uh, just about any um, 
Uh, any barrier beach that you have up and down the East Coast, does everybody know what this is? Uh, no, that's my left arm. Uh, but uh, what happens is that you will get your prevailing uh, winds and waves coming in like this. They will tend to hit the middle of, of the beach. Uh, and then on Cape Cod, you grow, uh, Cape Cod grows towards Monomoy, and it also grows up around Provincetown. So the same thing is happening on Plum Island. The, the, uh, your prevailing waves are coming in like this. They create what are called longshore currents that carry sand parallel to the shore. And they're both building up the end of Plum Island to the south towards Ipswich and to the north up towards the uh, uh, Merrimack River. Next. Um, and one of the things is if you, if you sit in front of your house on the beach like this, and you're looking out, and it looks like you're looking at the same plot of sand day after day. But actually, all of that sand is moving. So if you were to paint all the sand up above you red, uh, and then look down at your beach, your beach would go from, from white to pink to red to pink to white. Uh, even on, on, you know, when there weren't storms, just on, on very calm days, because that sand would be slowly moving down uh, in front of you. And of course, if you had a storm, that sand would be taken offshore and then moved back. Next. Uh, and this uh, simply shows you uh, the early days uh, of Plum Island. And of course, you are getting a lot of, of material sediments coming out of the Merrimack River and building up uh, a, a paleo delta um, offshore. Um, actually, the whole system uh, was about two miles further east. The sea level was about 250 feet lower, and the coast itself was about 250 feet east. So the river was coming out about here. Uh, uh, this is also <coughs> interesting because notice that little, that little indentation. Everybody knows it as the basin. Next. Um, and, uh, and then uh, and then that material moved into close to where it is now. Next. Uh, but if you notice the basin here, that was the old uh, exit to the Merrimack River back in the 1830s. Uh, and then because the longshore currents were coming up this way, they were bringing in sand, they, they started to block off the river, building up more and more material. Then you had a, steri a series of storms, hurricanes, uh, and, the, and the, the, the river broke through further north, up where it is now. And rivers like to do that. Um, they, they like to, it's just like a, a, a garden hose under pressure. They, they, wanna, they wanna go back and forth, sort of writhing like a snake. Uh, the Mississippi River, which spent about $3 billion to hold the Mississippi River where it, where it is, uh, it wants to move uh, to the west. It wants to actually join up with the Atchafalaya River. Um, down in, if you go down in Louisiana, it takes you about a half an hour to uh, pronounce, pronunciate the Atchafalaya <laughs> River. But anyway, uh, it's about the equivalent of seven Niagara Falls that are flowing from the Mississippi into the Atchafalaya, and that's where it wants to go. Uh, the other interesting thing about this is if you look back in the geological record, I think you would find that there was an earlier exit to the Merrimack River uh, down about here, uh, down in, in, the, uh, in the Parker River Refuge. Next. Um, and of course, you have a lot of marshes behind the island. Next. Um, next. And then you have some high areas uh, in the center of the island. And again, this is the undeveloped part of the island. Next. Uh, uh, this is the high sandy area. Next. And uh, in 1875, in 1879, we found the remains of a woolly mammoth. Uh, and of course, you know, 10,000 years ago, we were under about a half a mile of ice, and you had woolly mammoth and mastodon that were, that were traveling around. Uh, and uh, one of them died somehow, and, uh, and was part of the drumlin uh, on uh, on Plum Island, and uh, you might have read that um, they actually, everybody had forgotten about it. Uh, and then when they were doing research on Plum Island, there's another Plum Island in New York, 
that has an animal research center on it. And that is, they're moving that to Kansas, Manhattan, Kansas, of all strange places. But anyway, <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and so they had to do a, a, an environmental impact study to find out they want to, you know, develop this island and have people live there. But a lot of people don't want to live, you know, where there's rinder pests and anthrax in the soil. Uh, so they started doing research and they found this newspaper article and they thought it was about Plum Island in, in New York, uh, but then they did a little more digging and they found that it actually, it had been in the New Report newspaper and it simply been picked up by the Long Island newspaper back in the 1800s. Next. Um, this just simply shows you the, uh, the teeth of a woolly mammoth and a, and a mastodon. Next. Um, and then this shows you, as you come down out of the undeveloped part of the island, down to the developed part of the island, you'll notice that the, that the, uh, that the dunes actually get, uh, get lower. Next. Uh, and again, um, you know, a, a, a barrier beach system like this, the dune system, has to be able to move to stay healthy. So when you put a house in like this, um, you can see that it's, it's lower than the surrounding area because the, the, normally the dune would actually build itself naturally. Next. Um, and then, of course, the other things uh, that people have been doing have been elevating the houses on these, uh, on these pilings. And that makes your house very, very uh, safe. But next. Um, but unfortunately, uh, it doesn't do anything for the sand. So a number of years ago, I was down on, on Dolphin Island, Dolphin Island, but they pronounce it Dolphin Island down there. But anyway, uh, it's in Alabama, and I, and I saw all these houses out in the, you know, about you know, 60, 100 feet out in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. And they were up on pilings. I said, well, that's really clever. They, you know, these are fishing shacks. And you can fish right over your porch. Uh, but, of, but of course, it wasn't. They, had, they actually lose as much as 100 feet of, of beach uh, in a single year. So next. Um, so this is what Dolphin Island looked like in 1992. And next. And this is what it looked like in 2008. And you can see that roll over just swept across the beach. Uh, and, and, you know, it was constantly, and this is all being powered by sea level rise. This is what's causing all the barrier beaches to, to be moving uh, landward. Next. Um, and so what can we do about this? Uh, well, one thing you can do, this is actually in, in front of our house uh, down on Cape Cod, and we were losing anywhere from about four feet to eight feet off the top of this bank. Uh, during a series of storms in the, in the 1990s. And, um, I, and we got permission to build these what are called gabions, which are essentially wire baskets filled up with rocks about the, about the size of your fist. Uh, and then you can plant uh, uh, beach grasses on top of that. Uh, and, it, and it works very well. Um, un unfortunately, we're in a low energy situation. We're in a bay that's about uh, 10 miles from the inlet that leads uh, to, the, to the open ocean. So it's a fairly low energy situation. The highest waves you'll get um, maybe four or five feet. So they actually can go over the scabians, but the scabians have held very well for about 20 years. Next. Um, one of the things uh, that uh, people have been trying to do on Plum Island is to uh, repair the, the, uh, the jetties uh, next and, and of course, you want to repair the jetties because you want to keep uh, the river open for navigation. But the Army Corps of Engineers has to come up with a, what's called a cost-benefit analysis. And they have to show that the benefit will outweigh the cost of, of doing uh, the dredging. Well, that's very difficult to do in Newburyport because we don't have a large commercial fleet. We don't have a large commercial fishing fleet. We don't have container ships coming in. So uh, what, they, what they did is um, they have a special amendment. And uh, they said that essentially that there was a, um, I, that currents were coming out of the Merrimack River and carrying sand down this way. And that if you repaired the, uh, the jetties, uh, then you could improve the erosion situation. I frankly think 
Um, it's just my opinion, but I think they oversold that argument. Um, I, I don't think repairing the jetties is actually going to have very much uh, impact on the, on the houses down here where we've been seeing all the erosion. Next. Um, uh, the other thing, again, with most barrier beaches, you have that same, you, you have the creation of offshore sandbars. Almost every barrier beach will have offshore sandbars. But what happens is that in the winter, you take sand off the beach and it goes offshore into underwater sandbars. And then as the, uh, as the season progresses, the energy gets less and you get longer waves that bring the sand back on the beach. So you, you'll tend to get a series of little uh, sort of parabolic sandbars uh, just offshore. Uh, next. And uh, I tend, but you know, humans like to, like to come up with patterns uh, and cycles and everything like that. And there's millions of people that uh, saw this photograph taken from the Curiosity on Mars. And uh, millions of people think that there were are, are little Martian rats uh, <laughs> running around on, and I, Oh my God, I mean, that's ridiculous. This is a gopher. Uh, next. <laughs> and this is, this is an unofficial picture taken about three or four days before. Next. Uh, getting back to the situation on Plum Island, this is the area where three houses were lost. Next. And you can, again, you can see that it's low. Next. Um, and uh, so this is the Fordham Street groin coming out here. And the three houses that were lost were just, just downstream. The, the, the long shark currents come this direction, and the three houses that were lost were immediately downstream uh, of the Fordham Street uh, drawings. Next. And if you take um, Google Earth, uh, and then if you fly it down and then look back, you can get this altitude shot. And you can see that uh, it's actually a low-lying area. Um, probably fairly close to the area where, the, where possibly the Merrimack uh, exited during uh, uh, geological time. Uh, next. Uh, and again, you can see this is probably one of the lowest areas uh, on, on uh, Plum Island. Next. Um, and, you know, we're still rebuilding a lot of these houses on exactly the same footprint uh, as before but elevating them a bit. This is just down from the uh, central uh, groin next. Um, and uh, we're still building new houses uh, on, on Plum Island, um, you know, less than 100 feet from the, from the edge. Next. Uh, one of the things that uh, you have to do, remember those stairs that were sticking out this direction? Uh, well, you have to have two egresses uh, to be able to, to live in your house. Uh, in case of a storm. Um, uh, so what they did is they took the stairs out and they now go down the side. So you can have both a, a side stairs and a back stair. Next. Um, just to show you, there, we have, there are similar uh, problems like this. This is out on Nantucket. Next. Um, actually, if we go back to that slide, uh, I have a very, this was actually the cover of one of my books. Uh, and. Um, and you know, if anybody's familiar with, with book writing, you know that the last thing you do is come up with a book title, because you have to write the book first to know what it was that you were writing about. Uh, and then, uh, and so I finished the book, and we sort of went on a little busman's holiday, and we were down on Nantucket, and I went up to this is Baxter Road, uh, and just as I was taking this picture of this house that's right on the edge of this cliff, going down about 100 feet into the, uh, into the ocean, a guy came by and said, oh, the caption for that should be just seconds from the ocean. So I had my title. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, and again, a very similar situation where you have a number of houses on this very high, uh, high cliff. Uh, one of the differences is, you know, here most of the houses on the primary dune are maybe worth $800,000. You know, $800, uh, on Nantucket, each one of these houses is anywhere between five and $22 million. Next. Uh, so uh, one of the things that they want to do is build what are called the uh, marine mattresses. Next. Again, similar to a gabions filled with rock. Uh, so it would be like this. They're planning to spend $24 million uh, to build this. 
uh, covering it with sand and then planting above. Next. Um, uh, one of the things that um, is being considered on Plum Island is to build an artificial sand dune. Uh, I think one of the problems with the beach scraping is it was similar to this, where you simply built uh, a, a dune like that. So this was, um, this is a wider dune. Uh, neither of those are very effective, but if you build one like this with a, boom, a, a berm and then a dune, which is similar to what you have on a natural beach, uh, then that, that is fairly stable, and that would be the way to, to build an artificial dune. Next. Um, and this just simply shows you what happens uh, if you have the, the berm and the dune, you have a storm, and it will come in and it will remove that berm leave all the sand out here, you have to get that sand back, but the dune itself uh, will be protected uh, by the berm. Next. Um, and this just simply shows you, this is just downstream of, uh, uh, of the central groin, and this is where we lost about three houses uh, in, uh, in 2008. A um, number of them were abandoned, uh, the, the Bazada house was, was lost. Next. Um, so you can see there was erosion, again, longshore currents coming this direction, bringing this sand down this way. When you build a groin, the idea of a groin is to collect that sand. And so what, in fact, you do is you create a nice beach up here and you protect the houses up here, but you increase the amount of erosion downstream. So that's where we lost three houses in 2008. Next. This is where we lost the 3,000, uh, that we, we lost three houses uh, this past winter. Next, just to the south of, of Fordham's uh, groin. And then again, you can see here, this was the Fordham Way groin, three houses there. This was the Annapolis Way groin, three <coughs> houses there. And then up there is the central uh, groin where you lost three houses as well. Next. Um, and again, this is what a natural beach wants to do. You want to have this nice, wide pulse of sand that comes down. Uh, and if you don't have groins, you'll have that nice, wide pulse of sand in front of your house. Uh, and um, you know, there are no guarantees that it's going to save your house, but it's going to give you a little bit more time. And, and it makes the beach, uh, you know, it's a natural beach. The, other, the only thing when you when you build groins and you build seawalls, you, you increase the profile of the beach. So rather than having a nice, smooth, safe beach like this, you have a very steep beach. So there actually is um, there's a state program, and they have about two, uh, $20 million, both for removing and repairing dams and removing and, re and repairing seawalls. Uh, and we actually could get funding to, uh, uh, to remove some of these groins. Next. Um, and, uh, you know, every, every slide show has to have some sunset shots. So these are my sunset shots. Next. And this is a little subliminal advertising. Next. And then, of course, you have, some, you have to have your bloopers. So next. This was a guy who was meditating on the beach on Plum Island. Next. Next. <laughs> Because I'm a geochemist, right. and uh, oil 
and water don't mix, but some of the components of oil do dissolve in water. Mm -hmm. And so uh, th that would add to the toxicity of, of the situation. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, a large woolly mammoth tooth is a large woolly mammoth tooth is in the Custom House Maritime Museum on display. Yes, I know, uh, and also the the Phoebe Essex Museum uh, has some too. There have been a number of them that have been um, fishermen have, have brought them up in their trawls. Uh, uh, this this was actually the largest one that I know of uh, that was found uh, in New England. But they also, some of the early accounts said that it was crumbly when it came up. So I imagine, you know, this little bits of crumbly woolly mammoth in somebody's attic in New York. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, if you know, what is the role of insurance in all this? It seems that if you're building right on these seashores yeah. now, either you have to have a lot of money to self-insure. Yeah. Uh, you have to have a subsidy. Yeah, it, it, it's pretty complicated, and actually one of the things we're thinking about is, is having a, a seminar uh, on, on, on flood insurance. Um, probably some of you are aware, if you've opened up your insurance policy and you live on the coast, uh, it's going up as much as 900%, uh, you know, just in the, last, uh, in the last year. What they're trying to do is make the federal flood insurance program start to pay for itself. It hasn't been paying for itself for years and years and years, so all of us have been subsidizing. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of the houses, it's, it's pretty much always the same houses that go in the drink, and most communities know that you have five or six houses that are going to, you know, be flooded in, in every storm. And the way the federal flood insurance program has formally been written is that uh, you only get money if you rebuild that house where it had been before. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, actually, um, Louisiana did that, and you had to rebuild on exactly the place where you did before. And, and Mississippi, not known as a particularly progressive state, uh, uh, actually allowed people you could you could um, you could get paid the full value of your house, and then you could send some kids through college or move up to the mountains or, or whatever. And uh, FEMA does have a, a, a program for that now. Uh, uh, hopefully the easy questions over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where is the thinking, or where does the situation sit at this point regarding moving the groins on Plum Island? Uh, I think I'm the only person talking about it right here, right now. Uh, it, it makes sense. Um, we've actually um, we've had that up on our site, and I've no, been noticing that more people have been uh, going to that particular post uh, than any other. Um, it, it it makes perfect sense. It's a little bit counterintuitive because you know you, you think of you know groins were supposed to be anti-erosion devices. These were all put up between 1962 and 1964, and that was considered the thing to do to, uh, to prevent erosion. And there the were, were there engineering studies at that time to show that this would be effective? No. It was, it was a, someone had what they thought was a great thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, it did make sense. They did know that the longshore currents were coming down here, and you could protect, you know. I mean, if you're here, and you build your, your you know, a groin out here it makes perfect sense. You're protecting your house. It's just your neighbor that's uh, <laughs> not going to be very, uh, you know, happy with you. Yes. Who installed the groin on Palm Island? This was, I believe, this was done by the state. Yeah. Yeah. And and it would it would be the town that would have to apply, you know, for the funding to do that. Okay. Actually, they should have known right away because when they put the groins in on Palm Island. They didn't put in enough of them to start to scar out behind them, so they come in and put in some more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's that's usually what you see. One guy will put one in, and then and then the next guy starts losing his beat, so he puts one in, and then he puts one in. And, you know, and these these aren't cheap. Uh, sometimes they cut the iron right now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is that some of these groins are also in some of the weaker areas of the island already. Uh, uh, so it's. Not a good situation. Yeah. Um, the seawall you talked about that um, apparently weren't designed really, were those removed? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, uh, no, no. Um, and um, I was being polite. They're, they're actually, they're illegal <laughs> uh, seawalls. And the, the, the state was not pleased that they were, that they were put in. Uh, but it was, you know, it, it, was a, uh, it was an emergency situation and people felt they had to do what they, what they had to do to uh, protect their houses. Um, I think we will see this winter um, you know, how effective they are. Um, and are there any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel that, that there'll be a time when Plum Island is breached by the ocean? Yeah. yeah. How soon? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> uh, you know, it, 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 um, it's happened a couple times in the basin area. Again, that's a weak point. Uh, and it, it came close to happening at, at, uh, at the central groin. Unfortunately, you know, I think everybody's familiar with this. One of the real problems that you have on Plum Island is that 30 or 40 years ago, most of the houses out there might have been worth three or four thousand dollars. And then in 2004, they put in the water lines and the sewer lines, and then everybody remodeled their houses and made permanent year-round houses. So. You know, formally, you could, if a storm took your house away, you could walk away with it. And, you know, it would be a tragedy, but you wouldn't, you know, lose your life savings. Now, you know, you could lose your life savings. Uh, so it's a much more, it's a much more serious situation. But those, the water lines and the sewer lines are right on those streets that people are living on. And so last year, you know, the, the oceans were only about 20 feet from the water lines and sewer lines. So it wouldn't take too many more storms, and you'd actually be breaking, breaking the water lines and the sewer lines. Yes? I'm thinking of the really dramatic pictures that you showed of these houses that had been on pilings and yeah. then were on stilts. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you're familiar with Ian McCard, his book, Design with Nature, where yeah. he equates yeah. houses on pilings that are built yeah. high yeah. with heavy erosion and houses that are built low Mm -hmm. with spreading roofs, with actually building up to do. Did you find anything like that in your research or in your experience to correlate that? Um, no. <laughs> uh, I, I'd, have to, I'd like to look into that. I'd like to look into that because that, that's kind of a, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, over here. Yeah, uh, where did Plum Island come from? I mean, was, was it from a surge from the sea, or was it erosion? It was erosion. Most of, has anybody been um, up to um, Echo Lake in, uh, uh, in Franconia, New Hampshire? It's right below Cannon Mountain. Uh, I used to spend wonderful summers sort of lying on my back in Echo Lake, and you'd look up on, on Cannon Mountain, and there'd be, you know, a mother bear with three cubs, and it felt like you could almost reach up and grab her, which you wouldn't want to do. But anyway. Uh, the, um, the Connecticut River comes out of one side of Echo Lake, and the Merrimack River, by way of the Pemigewasset, uh, comes out the other side of that lake. So that's the top of the divide, if you will. And so those two rivers are, are coming down on either, either side. So it's the breakdown of, of the White Mountains. Um, so all the granite that gets broken down into silica and, and garnet and uh, and quartz. You know, after a storm, if you go on the beach, you'll see a, a lot of red sand. Those are little tiny garnets, little tiny, you know, semi-precious uh, gems. And because they're a little heavier than the silica grains, uh, they, they get left behind after, after a storm. Um, so that, that's where the sand comes from, and it builds up over thousands and thousands of years uh, of erosion. Um, and then and then Plum Island itself is also, it has some drumlins. And drumlins were left here by the glaciers when the glaciers were, were retreating. Um, it left big hunks of, of gravel. And that low area was probably between two drumlins. And then you had the sand uh, in, in between it. Yes? Yes? Just, uh, has the effect been what a natural erosion would be since we don't have volcanic behavior? To replace land uh, it's, and as well. Um, but basically, it's you know it's um, ice <coughs> and wind mm -hmm. and and water is is eroding the you know the white mountains and, 
and uh, and you know the, the 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 cores of some of these mountains are volcanic. So you do have you know magma um, uh, granite is actually you know magma that was formed deep deep down, um, uh, but it's being eroded now uh, to to form these those minerals that are moving. You're, you're straining me. I have to go back to rocks for jocks to remember this. Stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, first, um, that's so cool because Cooley Mountains are beautiful. It's nice to think that these two wonderful places are connected. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was wondering if there's any kind of like geology or geology that you can talk about in the book that would explain the geology of the mountains and the geology of the mountains. Yeah. Like, what Plum Island will look like um, given like the dynamics, like the same way you know um, what a barrier island will do in so many years. Like, what eventually happens with that? It, um, it will it will gradually break up. Um, you will see it will you know there'll be areas where you you'll have inlets broken through. Uh, one of the things that that um, is fortunate about Plum Island is that you don't have a large body of water behind it. For instance, in in Pleasant Bay on Cape Cod, um, you have the inlet down here and you have a large body of water down, uh, up up here. And what happens is you'll get the high tide. What might be three or four, four or five feet higher inside the bay, and then the low tide will go down, and then you have a head of water. So actually, when when a breach happens, the, the it will become an inlet and stay open on the outgoing tide. So the breach will probably happen during the storm on a high tide, and it will seal itself up. But it's on the low tide if if you get a flow of water going out towards the ocean, then that will scour it and keep it open. You're a little bit safer on Plum Island because you don't have that situation. I could see a situation where you have a storm surge coming in and having the water artificially high you know, inside uh, Plum Island Sound. Uh, and then if a breach occurred, then you could, then you could have one, you know, a, a breach that would, that would stay open. Okay, yes. Who owns the land underneath a house that is eventually left stranded on piles out in the ocean? <laughs> <laughs> the owner does. Uh, and he has to keep paying taxes. <laughs> yes, there's, there's actually, there's a wonderful example of that. Uh, you, down on the Cape, you have lots of examples where, you know, a beach will grow and it will grow, you know, across one town, uh, town line into another town line. And basically the, the you know the old way of handling that is that if you happen to be on a beach that's growing, that's your good fortune. And if it's eroding, that's that's your tough luck. There was actually a woman down in South Carolina and her father had bought 25 acres of land on the end of a of a barrier beach and he developed it and he sent four kids through college. Uh, and then he gave the land to his daughter by that time, the beach had grown to 125 acres, worth 32 million dollars. So she happened to be on the right part of the, of the beach. So if you wanted to, you know, build a house on, on Plum Island, the place to build it would be down on Sandy Point or up on, on North Point, on the two areas that are that are growing. Yes. Uh, yeah, in the photographs you showed where the stone was that was uncovered from like 40 years ago. Yeah. Which is about where the shoreline is now. Yeah. Do you have any explanation why? Uh, well, why it was put in? Uh, well, I, well, I think what's happened since? Um, they're pretty much they're still there. Uh, they might have been covered when when some of the. Uh, when some of the, uh, the the sea walls were put in, but I think I think you'll still see those. Yeah, but the point is, 40 yeah. years ago, the shoreline was where that those stones were placed, which is similar to where it is now. And 40 years has since gone, and they were yeah. covered for 40 years. Yeah, the explanation for that. Beaches are dynamic things. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a wonderful quote uh, that Albert Einstein. Um, uh, warned his son to stay away from the physics of sand because he said it was it was like rocket science but more complicated. Uh, um, That's what he went into. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, but actually, um, you know, a barrier beach you, you'll go through um, different phases where you know it may grow for a while and then it will pause. Uh, it may actually grow out for a while. Uh, it will appear to grow up, but the net of 
effect is always that it's that it's moving towards the towards the west, towards the towards the mainland. But that that's very encouraging that the shoreline was there 40 years ago, and it may even though it back there again, it yeah, was covered for 40 years. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes. <laughs> where? 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 I would be very careful. And I probably wouldn't park my car there. <laughs> uh, no, you know, this is this is what we have to start thinking about in the future. Um, you know, and uh, I, I would I would look at, you know, above ground parking uh, instead. Yeah, so Bill, that raises the question, what should the selectmen and planning boards and city councilors and all of that stuff be thinking about? It needs positive dynamics to the island a little bit, but do we have the right zoning? Do we have the right... No, I think, right you know, we're, we're, this is happening up and down all the coasts now. Everybody is sort of in the situation where we are, and people are getting together and realizing, you know, that, that we have a problem. You know, to me, it's kind of amazing because I remember... You know, again, when I was an undergraduate, finding out about all of this, and we figured, well, you know, now that the scientists know about it, uh, by the time we graduate, all the politicians will have figured it out, and there'll be nothing for us to do. Uh, but you know, nothing has nothing has happened. So we're really, um, you know, we're right at those beginning stages, and that's that's why an organization like this is, is so important. Yeah. We've talked a lot about the barrier beach. What about the great marsh behind it? What's your prediction for what's going to happen to our great marsh? Uh, the great marsh is going to be great. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the interesting thing about this is that uh, most estuaries, when people first started looking into, into sea level rise, they were saying, well, you know, if you have a lot of sea level rise, you're going to kill off the marshes because if you get more than a half an inch of sea level rise over three years, uh, it will actually drown the marshes. Um, we thought we were seeing that in Pleasant Bay. What happened is an inlet opened up, and overnight you had the equivalent of about 50 years of sea level rise, because the bay is now about six inches higher at high tide and six inches lower at low tide. So there were dramatic changes. We thought you would see negative changes, but in fact, what happened is the marshes started growing out about six inches into the into the water uh, a year, and also six inches into the Spartina patents a year, uh, and that simply means the Spartina altered flora is about twice as productive as the Spartina patents. So the whole bay was becoming uh, more productive, and um, and you know it, basically you have estuaries because of sea level rise. If the sea level for some reason stopped or started to decline, then your estuaries would, would be in trouble. But as long as the sea levels are rising, you're keeping your estuaries cleaner. Um, there's, you know, since Sandy, there's been a couple of cases uh, on, on Fire Island, actually, uh, where um, you, know, you have new inlets that are opening and you're getting a lot of, of seawater that's coming in and flushing out the bays and making them more productive and you're seeing new animals come in there. On Pleasant Bay, you know, we're seeing all kinds of different species that we, that we never had before. Uh, so on that nice positive note, I think, we should, uh, I think we should end, but I thank you very much. I think we should give another round.